Thanks to an industrious YouTuber, we can all watch the camp scrimmage from this week. And I'll tell you this, Ian Jackson is not going to be afraid of any moment, ever. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Friday, June 21st, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining us at the place to get your Carolina content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. I want to send a special shout out to all you everydayers out there and all the members of the Locked On Discord, uh, excuse me, Locked On Tar Heels Discord family. It is good to be together. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Coming up on the show today, it is going to be a fun Friday show. I am glad you're here. Uh, we're going to talk about takeaways from the camp scrimmage game. On Wednesday, obviously, if you're with us on yesterday's show, Coach Rob broke down what he's been seeing from all the guys at camp. Um, but we're going to talk about the scrimmage game itself today because we didn't talk about that on the show. Wanted to save that for today. Got several basketball recruiting updates for you and a potential scheduling change for the Tar Heels for this upcoming season. We'll explain all of that in just a bit. Uh, but want to get right into this scrimmage. Again, Coach Rob didn't actually get to see the scrimmage this week. That's when he was meeting with Coach Davis, as he was talking about on the show yesterday. And thankfully, though, even though he didn't get to watch this one, um, a, a YouTuber put it up. Uh, some the same person that filmed one of the camp games last year. And so um, you and everyone else out there can go find it for yourself and watch it and enjoy it and try to nitpick and take away more than you ever should because it's just a scrimmage game but that's what we've got in the offseason right we're gonna we're gonna completely overblow everything we see right and and just talk about it no so that's fun that's what we're gonna dive into today but i i just gotta tell you right out of the gate i don't know about you but for me to watch this and to start unpacking it and, and, and thinking about it and processing these uh, guys and how they will play together it's just good to be watching Tar Heel basketball. I think we've all just got a bitter taste in our mouths from the Alabama game. That's the last time we saw uh, Carolina in action. And it's just like, let's just move on. Let's just get to the next thing. And this was one of the first opportunities to do so. Let's start with takeaways uh, before we, you know, we might look at a few player specific things, but I think these big picture takeaways are what you're here to hear from me. So number one, as I said in the cold open, Ian Jackson he, he's not afraid to let it rip tater chip or, or do anything of that nature. Um, and I think we probably knew this from watching him in the McDonald's all American game and other moments where he just gets shots up. Right. Um, he's somebody I would say just doesn't have a conscious, right. It's kind of like Caleb love, um, which can be a good and bad thing, depending on what kind of day it is in terms of getting a bunch of shots up there. Here's what I like about what I expect Ian Jackson's role to be this year versus what like a Caleb Love role was um, in his years at North Carolina. Whereas those Tar Heels would often have to um, rely fully on Caleb Love, which was great at times when he was on and cooking, but when he was going through kind of a, a dry spell, it was tough, right? Um, and a lot of times the guys, and understandably so, would default to Caleb. Late shot clock, let's just give him the ball and let him go um, because he was willing to do it. Ian Jackson strikes me as a guy that is willing to do that whenever. But here's the difference between Caleb's era and Ian's era. These Tar Heels don't need Ian to do that. There, there are going to be times when they will and, and will allow that but it doesn't have to be all the time like it was with Caleb. And so uh, well, like something we were talking about in the discord is if, if there are moments where Ian's cooking, you just let him keep cooking. But if not, when he, when he's cold, you know, it's okay to get him to the bench for a little bit. Cause you got the reigning ACC player of the year that can take over. And so that's really good. And, and this game was kind of a microcosm of that. Ian started off kind of slow, but boy, boy, did he heat up late. Just, Second half, just hitting shot after shot after shot. I mean, it, it was pretty ridiculous to watch. And obviously, again, it's just a scrimmage. But when you see a dude get hot like that, it's like, oh, man, 
man, man, man, man, man. Now, one thing I think is, is the coaching staff's obviously going to hone in with him on, uh, as they start working on things, when do you take those shots? How do you take them? Uh, you know, there's a lot of pretty inefficient mid range stuff that he was saying. So all of that they'll work on and they'll get honed in, but it's, it's nice to see a young man who ain't afraid of the moment and is going to step up so that it's not just an RJ or not just whomever it is. He's going to do it. I love it. So Ian's that second big, 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 this might even be bigger than Ian takeaway for me is boy, this team is oriented extremely differently than what we're used to seeing. There ain't no lane clogger out there. If I can get down into my South Georgia, um, and so my, my point that I wrote down is it's really interesting to watch just how rarely there is someone camped out in the paint. Um, I mean, I mean, it's just there, there are possessions, multiple possessions where I'm just watching. Is anyone going to touch the paint with their foot? <laughs> and it just wouldn't happen. You know, sometimes uh, on a drive or, you know, in rebounding action, things like that. But when the main primary action is happening, Nothing, nobody in there. And again, it's a scrimmage game. So we're not doing a lot of sets and we're not running a bunch of that kind of stuff. But even still, in a typical scrimmage like that, you would see somebody like Armando Baycott go get in the paint and let's operate. Now, if if this is the spacing that we're going to use, Tar Heel friends and family, it's going to be, we already know it's going to be different, but you're seeing it be different. And I think as somebody else said in our uh, in the Locked on Tar Heels Discord on, on Thursday, different doesn't have to be bad. But you just, I'll, I'll add to that, you just got to make ha- figure out how to make it good, right? How do we use those things to our advantage? Because all that space, when you've got guys like R.J. Davis and Ian Jackson and Drake Powell, uh, Cade Tyson, that can drive the ball. That's going to play to their strengths and advantages. How how often in the last several years have we seen that happen to Carolina where teams will just spread them out and carve them up because they've got that backcourt talent? Now it's the Tar Heels that are going to be doing that. So, um, and, and even when somebody does post up, it's amazing how rare it was Um like that it wouldn't be down around the goal. It would be like Jalen Withers. uh, And this happened just before halftime posted up like at the high post and basically got moving right backing it up from the high post. And so that that's a whole thing. Um, I third, I really like as coach Rob said yesterday on the show that, that RJ Davis and Elliot Cadeau aren't typically teaming up. They're going on opposite teams so that they can go at each other in a healthy way, not in a like, I don't like you sort of way. No, like in a, we're, you know, we're this backcourt tandem that's got to be locked in together. Um, And so we need to give each other as much competition as we can. And so um, it was great to see. There there were a couple of times throughout that, the scrimmage where they just go back and forth at one another. It was a lot of fun to see. Next, uh, I, I got to thinking, you know, I wonder what's going through Cade Tyson's head just in the first couple possessions of this game. I was thinking he was like, I was just at Belmont and now I'm sitting here in the Smith center in the summer in a scrimmage game guarding three time NBA champion and national champion Danny green in a just summer game. What, what a wild change of scenery and people for somebody like K Tyson. Pretty cool. Um, but speaking of K Tyson, I do want to say a couple things for him. I loved watching this and seeing his maturity, his pacing, his, his capability, his recognition of how to handle a moment. He's not forcing stuff. He's letting the flow of the offense come to him. And he scored a very quiet, I, th- I think I counted around 10 points for him. Um, I, he had a stop and pop that looked really good. Um, there, there was a moment where I, I really thought was really strong thinking of his, um, capability. He was out on the, I think he was at the top of the perimeter could have taken a three, one of those, like, Hey, that's open at any point in the shot clock, looked down, realized that Elliot Cadeau had gotten switched onto him. So what does he do? He just drives him, gets by him, 
uses that big, massive 6768 frame to just score over him. Reminder, I'm just going to keep reminding us all, all offseason. Cade Tyson had more two-point attempts than he did three-point attempts last season. So you're not going to see him just sit around and settle for threes. So that's good. Um, look, I know it's a scrimmage. I was really impressed with Zayden High in this game. Um, his his motor, his effort, his energy, um, knocking down some smooth threes. I think he even too small Seth Trimble after hitting a three on him. And he didn't get back on defense quick enough after that, but was able to get a chase down block out of it. Um, I really like his closeouts. Watch, go back and watch how Zayden High closes out. One of the things you're taught to do is like, say there's a guy in the corner beyond the three-point arc and you got to close back out to him. You don't take these big, huge lumbering steps because then they can run past you. You just chop down. You can, you can hear his sneakers doing that on multiple occasions in this game because Zayden's really trying to work on those things of like closing out well and not getting blown by. Him. You love to see it. So just want to shout him out because I, I, I was proud of him in that man drake powell is is as advertised you can do a bunch of different things and affect the game in a bunch of different ways you love to see that um i, I also really like to see rj kind of deferring in this moment he's he's clear and far away the best player on this team but he recognizes that the moment doesn't always have to be about him. He can get it to other guys, let them cook. Like as Ian was getting hot, RJ was like, no, you, you got it, buddy. <laughs> Here you go. Um, and so, yes, more often than not, he's going to be the guy to need to take over. But why not let these other players get these experiences that he's already had? And then he can he can do what he needs to do when he needs to do it. I think that's great leadership from RJ Davis, and I was really glad to see that. Um, Elliot, I mean, just confidently taking threes. Again, it's scrimmage, but getting them up. I think I counted four that he made, maybe missed one. Um, good good stuff to see there. It's just, again, I think it's so much a mental, a confidence thing that he's got to get. So obviously much more to unpack with all of these guys, but those are just some of my biggest takeaways that I had from this. Um, obviously Danny green was playing with the guys, but you saw on the sideline, if you're watching, you probably picked out Kenny Williams, Garrison Brooks was over there. Tyler Zeller was standing off to the side. Love to see him and Danny green, just standing over there, chopping it up, having a good time. And as a reminder though, there are going to be much more alumni at the, the second session of summer camp. And so we should get a more true, um, alumni, um, current team game. So that's where we're going. All right. Well, there's got to be more guys that come into playing these games in future years. Who are some of those recruits that might end up coming to Chapel Hill? I've actually got three basketball recruiting updates coming for you, and we'll hit those in just a second. Right after I tell you about game time, I'm really starting to get excited about the baseball, the MLB All-Star game. I, I just love the festivities, particularly the home run derby, but the game itself is so fun. Um, wouldn't it be fun? to go get tickets to this thing, go to the game. Absolutely. Maybe you live in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex and you're like, Hey, last minute, I just want to go. Maybe you're one of our new uh, conference partner, SMU friends, and you, and you want to go. Well, to do that, I got to suggest that you use game time because prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. That's what game time does for you. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and a lowest price guarantee. And with all of that game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. I went and looked up some of the tickets for the all-star game, which isn't, you know, still a couple weeks away, but already cheapest ticket to the game I could find was two thirty one. There's all these great deals down low. I mean, just some really good numbers. Go check it out. Game time app, uh, MLB All-Star Game. Good stuff. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download their app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for $20 off. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Got three recruiting updates for you. One we've talked about multiple times lately, another that Carolina has been kind of back and forth on, and then a third that I've been waiting on this scholarship offer to drop for probably months now, and it finally did. So let's go in that same order that I just talked about them. 
a Caden Lewis, right? We've talked about him. Now, this is the third time on the show, and I think in the past two weeks. Well, here's why, though. The first of those conversations was just about Carolina showing interest in him, in him, having watched him this summer, several conversations. And then literally right after that, Coach Davis extended an offer to him. But now it, we keep progressing down the tracks and we get a key bit of news is that Caden Lewis, we learned on Thursday, um, is going to visit North Carolina. I saw that reported by both 247 Sports and On3. And so mul multiple outlets reporting the exact same information. But here's why I love this. Check in with this. Caden Lewis is coming twice to Chapel Hill next week on Thursday, June 27th, is coming on an unofficial to Carolina. That's great stuff. Should be right as um, basketball camp has wound down. But the even bigger news is that it's not just an unofficial. He's going to come on an official visit to North Carolina, October 4th through 6th. So I know that's quite a ways away, but here's the good news. What, what do we always look for in these fall recruiting trips? What's going on with football around those dates? That, my friends, is homecoming weekend when Caden Lewis will be on campus. The Tar Heels are playing Pitt in football. And so really wise move there by Coach Davis and the staff. Um, and we'll start seeing more of that, too, once we hear uh, like the date for, I almost called it late night, um, live action. And, and, you know, typically you want to try to get a bunch of dudes to that. So great news. Caden Lewis coming uh, both next week and uh, early October, and we'll be there over homecoming weekend. This is great news for the Tar Heels. A quick primer on him. If you hadn't watched our shows about a Caden Lewis, he's a four-star combo guard, just skyrocketing up the 2025 rankings um, and, and doing great stuff there. And uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know which way you want to look at this, but it's just picking up offers left and right from everybody, everybody in the book. But Carolina's in on that, and they've got two visits coming. And that's, at this point, with a highly coveted recruit, that's about all you can ask. So uh, if you didn't watch those shows where we talked about a Caden Lewis, go back and do those. Next, Nico Bundalo. Carolina has now offered him. Uh, I first saw this news. Always, we want to give credit. Um, and so first saw this from either Inside Carolina or the 247 general um, kind of side of things. And, and reporting that Carolina has offered Bundalo. Uh, and so we stay here in the class of 2025, same as a Caden Lewis. Um, Bundalo is ranked 24th at the consensus rankings, 18th at on three, 25th at 247, 29th at ESPN, and 39th at Rivals. He's a 6'9", 205 pound power forward. He's a guy that can step out and stretch it. It's that stretch four that Carolina is going to need and want in the Hubert Davis system or what we expect them to need and want. So I love this. He's from Ohio, from Uniontown, Ohio. Uh, with Mudala, it's an interesting story because there was interest. Um, like around this time last summer, there, there was conversations, it felt like, but an offer never came. And then clearly now Carolina, after kind of probably tracking with him, I, I haven't heard background um on, on how Carolina has kept tabs on him through the year. But now they're clearly all, I mean, regardless of that, they're clearly all back in on him because they've now offered him. So what this means is that the class of 2025 is now back up to 15 active offers from Carolina. Remember, it was 15. Isaiah Harwell um, cut Carolina out of his final four choices. So that was down to 14. But now with the Bundalo offer, it's back up to five. And I just want to remind you, so many of the offers in the class of 2025, especially in that first wave of offering all those elite guys that we've talked about over and over and over again, a ton of them were power forwards. You just think of guys like Cam Boozer and Koa Pete, for example. And so uh, to me, this doesn't indicate much of anything right now other than, hey, let's just get another iron in the fire to see if we can grab one, maybe two of these power forwards, whatever they want to do there. Um, and so great, great stuff there. Uh, I love going after Boondalo. And then the third one, and this is the guy that I've been waiting on for a while for Carolina to offer him basketball wise. And I'll say why I mean it like that. But again, I've been waiting on this a long time and here it comes. Um, so Kendra Harrison, 
becomes the third offer that Coach Davis has made in the class of 2026, the second this week. Remember, the first is Cole Clore. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. The second was earlier this week, Tyron Stokes, who's an absolute dude. And then now, Kendra Harrison. He's a 6'7", 243-pound uh, power forward from Reedsville, North Carolina. If you don't recall, if, if you were missing it on social media, this dude was around a lot this spring, all over the place, everywhere. Um, at, at And I mean that like at Carolina. It was at basketball games, checking in all the time. You love to see it. At all signs point to this young man wants to be a Tar Heel, but he's just a big bruising dude. Broke a rim in basketball earlier this high school season. And uh, looking at his spot in the rankings for the class of 2026, he is 33rd in the consensus rankings. Oh, but guess what, friends? Here's the thing about Harrison. He's also the number six overall recruit in football in the class of 2026 and the number one overall tight end. So Mac Brown and company have already offered. And now it's just that the basketball scholarship is now coming through. Um, I mean, obviously Carolina has enjoyed a phenomenal tight end room the last several years. And this will go a long way to maintaining that in the class of 2026. Um, so great stuff there. Obviously there's some, some history with some great um, two-way football basketball players at Carolina. Julius Peppers uh, obviously jumps to mind. He was not the only player on that team, but you know, obviously the, the, the big name for us. Um <clears throat> And so the way this goes is um, obviously would probably because of his higher ranking in football, but I mean, pretty highly elite at both. I think he would be with football a majority of the time. And then once we get to December ish past the bowl game, whatever that would be, would come be with the basketball team. So you, you wouldn't want to overly heavily rely on him, but boy, you could utilize him um, once he got around and, and that would be great. Um, he's been seen Harrison has been for a while as a heavy Carolina guy loves this place, but with his profile, particularly from a football standpoint, and again, truthfully from a basketball standpoint as well, everyone is going to be coming after this dude. Like Kirby smarts going to want him to be tight end for the university of Georgia. So Mac Brown, Hubert Davis going to have to be all in on this together, getting this young man, uh, to be a Tar Heel. Let's keep these guys in state. Cole Clore, let's keep him. Harrison, let's keep him. The, this one for me, Kendra Harrison, is the kind of thing where it's like, if they can't get this done as badly as it seems like he wants to be a Tar Heel, that'd be a bad look. This is one that Carolina has to get, has to get Harrison, and we'll keep tabs on it, obviously. But uh, man, I'm excited about the possibility on both fields of play. So we'll keep our eyes out for that. Well, uh, we move from talking about the scrimmage and then some personnel stuff <clears throat> to talking about Carolina's non-conference schedule for this upcoming season. We thought it was set, but maybe not after all. <laughs> I'll explain what I mean coming up in just a second. We've talked a good deal in the past several weeks about Carolina's non-conference schedule for this upcoming season and how it's basically already set. Um, just as a reminder of the breakdown of how games work, you get 31 regular season games. As an ACC school, you play 20 conference games, meaning that you have 11 non-conference games you can play. For Carolina, they've got a multitude of events, so there's not too terribly many like one-off things that they even have the option to schedule themselves. It's really just like four right now. There's a whole multitude of events this upcoming season. You've got three games at Maui Invitational. You've got Alabama in the ACC SEC Challenge. You've got the Jumpman Invitational, which is going to be against Florida. And oh, by the way, have y'all seen this massive kid that Florida has on their roster? It's coming in as a freshman. <laughs> Go check him out. I forget his name off the top of my head. But uh, that's going to be wild. Uh, and then CBS Sports Classic, where Carolina will be playing UCLA. So that already right there is six of your games. Um, last year, Carolina played in the Jimmy V Classic, where they played UConn. This year and next year, that kind of spot is essentially being replaced by the home and home with Kansas. So Carolina will travel to Kansas on Friday, November 8th. That now gets up to seven games, meaning that you just have four by games remaining essentially for those of you watching on youtube i've pulled up 
uh, just my version of the non-conference schedule because it's not been officially put out yet. This is just me putting all the pieces together. For those of you listening, if you want to pull up my uh, Twitter thread and look at it, um, it, it's on there and you can see that non-conference schedule so you can follow along as well. So as for these four buy games, you've got Elon to open the season on, on Monday, November 4th. You've now got American uh, on Friday, November 15th. You're at Hawaii on Friday, November 22nd, leading to Maui. And then you host LaSalle on Saturday, December 14th. There's your 11 non-conference games, right? Yeah, all good, all squared away. Woo, honky-dory. But then, oh wait, just a second. By the way, hold your horses. Last Thursday, June 13th, Made for March, which is a Twitter account, um, which is dedicated to getting out information about college basketball scheduling info. And it's very reliable. They do a great job of it, putting out who, who teams are scheduling, if it's a buy game, what the, the number is. And so on Thursday, June 13th, they tweeted this out. Scheduling news. North Carolina will host Campbell huh, on Sunday, December 29th as part of its 2024-25 non-con schedule. This is a buy game with a $90,000 guarantee, end quote. Hold the phone. What's going on here? Because Carolina can only have 11 games in the non-conference schedule. They've already got 11 games that we've learned about in the non-conference schedule. But then there's this reporting that Carolina is going to host Campbell on Sunday, December 29th. They can't do that. That would make 12 non-conference games. And then our, our guy, Michael Coe, he tweets this out. So obviously he's seeing it and thinking it's a thing too. So I just went straight to the source with the Twitter account with made for March. Cause I've actually never interacted with them, even on my locked on college basketball side. Um, but they do a great job. And so I was like, Oh, let me just reach out. And so we actually talked back and forth a good bit. Um, they had actually just realized it too, about the potential for these 12 games. And so we had some really good discourse back and forth. I, uh, Michael Coe and I actually messaged back and forth just saying like, Hey, are you noticing anything with this? What's going on? What are you seeing? And so with 12 games, something's off. And while we are yet to find, uh, to be able to pin down, nail down exactly what's going to happen, here's what we all believe is going on. Stay with me. Um, immediately, and obviously, the issue, or or whatever the, the, the difference is, this one game off, it cannot be with the event the events because Maui's locked in ACC SEC is locked in Jumpman's locked in CBS sports is locked in again. That's six of your games. It also can't be the Kansas game because that's locked in. It's been widely reported in a big way. And then that brings us down to the four by games. You figure it won't be Elon because that's been very publicly discussed, uh, put on schedules and it's the season opener. So you expect that American was announced pretty recently and there's the whole Jackie Manuel connection. And so I expect that to happen. And Hawaii, the, the third of these games, is while you're on the way out to Maui, it's already been talked about. It's the plan as Carolina heads out to play in the Maui Invitational. So I just don't see that um, coming off the books. So literally the only game that's left then is LaSalle. And so our thinking, uh, it, it, me and in and, and talking with Michael Coe, him and, and the Made for March account, we all think, that this means that something's going to happen with the LaSalle game where it gets changed. So let me, let me put up a new non-conference schedule where I've just, I've got all 12 of these games up there. Um, but you see Campbell added on December 29th and I've just crossed through LaSalle for the time being, just until we have more firm information. And so my expectation of what's going to happen here is that made for March is right. And Carolina actually will host Campbell on December 29th and that the LaSalle game will probably get bumped back to 2025, 26 and Carolina will play them then. Um, because here's part of why, uh, as you think about the schedule, as it is right now, before you knew about Campbell, there was a 10 day break from Wednesday, December 4th through Wednesday, December or through Saturday, December 14th, uh, where Carolina could have exam break. Here's the problem there though. Somewhere in that, I expect it to be Saturday, December 7th or Sunday, December 8th will be Carolina's first ACC game. Remember, they always play an ACC game early now and then the, the chunk of the other 19. It's going to fall in between there if history has anything to say about it, which I think it will. So in that case, you don't really have a break in the schedule for Carolina to have exam break. 
However, go with me on this. If you take out the LaSalle game and you put in that early ACC game for December 7th or 8th, then you do actually have uh, kind of a pretty typical space that lines up with last year's exam space too, where Carolina would play on December 7th or 8th and then be off until they play Florida in the Jumpman Invitational on December 17th. That lines up, and I like what that says. Also, um, like last year, the exam break was December 5th through 16th. So this is just so close right there. Also, you might recall that after Carolina went through all of their non-con, the last part of the non-con they played before jumping into the rest of ACC play was to play Charleston Southern, like the, the worst on paper team they played all year. When was it? On Saturday, uh, excuse me, on, uh, was it Saturday or Friday? Because we had a leap year. Anyway, December 29th, literally the exact same day that this Campbell game is being reported as being played, which is on a Sunday this year. So this to me makes a lot of sense. It adds up and I think is what is actually going to happen. The LaSalle game will get moved, bring in Campbell, and that's going to wrap up the non-conference schedule. So uh, at some point, I expect this to be made official. It's obviously not been yet, but uh, stay tuned. And as we eventually get that, uh, we, we imagine that it will be what happens. All right, gang. Happy Friday to you all. It's been great to be together. If you're not subscribed to the show on audio and video, go ahead and do that. It's very simple. If you're not part of the Locked On uh, Locked On Tar Heels Discord family, man, we'd love to have you. Come for the Tar Heels. Stay for that community. It's free. The link's in the show notes. Very seriously. It's a great place to be. We're chatting all the time. All that conversation. Uh, everyone was watching the, the camp scrimmages, and then we've just been talking about it basically all day Thursday. It's really cool. And if you're not in there, you're missing out. Um, so there's that. Come join it. If you want to email me, talk about other things, locked on tar heels at gmail.com. Would love to catch you there. All right, don't forget tonight there is the meet and greet with Coach Rob. And so, uh, listen back to yesterday's show for the details or just look in the Discord because we've been talking about it there as well. All right, y'all, it's always a great day to be a tar heel. We'll talk again on Monday, but until then, peace. <laughs>